Hey everybody, we're going to do another root canal with the gentle wave. It's number 19 and, and the talking points of this case that make it kind of interesting are just the fact that life happens and we got to make decisions along the way. What do you do when you have decay underneath the filling? Do you take it out? Do you leave it in? Do you patch over it, underneath it, through the sides of it, whatever that may be. And I'm just going to show you what I do because I've gotten to the point now with amalgams I just take those suckers out. So we'll look at that. The other thing is what happens when you are doing your size and just what if you make a mistake or make a, the wrong decision? I shouldn't say a mistake because it's, it's not something that you can't undo. But what happens if you put the wrong ceiling cap on the procedural instrument? Can you flip caps? Um, instrumentation protocols. Do you always have to access and get lengths and do your, your fluid pathways before your sound seal? Which is kind of what you, I do when I'm just accessing through a crown or whatever. So we'll just talk about the little scenarios, the game change ups that we're going to do and then what happens and doesn't matter. So let's give this case a go. Um, we're going to do a lower molar. This is tooth number 19 and it's just what we get dealt with. So this one is caries induced pulpitis with an aging amalgam restoration. So let's uh, pull this x-ray up here and uh, let's lose me for a second just so you can take a look at this decay. You know what, we've got a pulp stone, we have a pulpal floor, we have um, an amalgam and underneath that is a whole bunch of decay and part of the wall like you've part of the wall broke out on it so for me we're gonna just remove it it just makes life simple but then how do you build up on it so keep that in mind second thing we're going to do is take a look at the comb beam and just appreciate the anatomy and in this we definitely kinda have the the figure eight, kind of the bowling pin, um, mesial, mesial root. Let's take a look at that. And you can see how that just kind of invaginates right here. You know, that would be one of those things if you did try to prep a mid mesial, you'd probably strip perf right there. It'd be very, very small. We definitely got a large isthmus um, in the distal, so it's going to be very ovoid. Um, so those are the things, you know, I am perceiving as you kind of manipulate that, that those puppies are connected. So I know I got lateral anatomy galore and we're going to see what that's going to look like. Nothing much going on periapically. There's not any rarefaction. It's just sort of normal anatomy. It's not percussion sensitive, but it is very temperature sensitive. And that's kind of the presentation here. So, um, you know what, you've got this buckle feeling and we got this MOD going on here and so I choose not to to really place a rubber dam in these situations a lot of you know build up on the teeth only because it's just I want to open up the boxes so I can get the rubber dam to seat underneath the contacts um, I'm looking around it you can see some some uh, defect in the flossing defect where that wall's missing um, underneath the contacts we got some issues so this tooth is slated for a new crown obviously you can see the broken restoration right here and then the missing tooth structure and so you know for me I'm focusing on the occlusal and I'm not going to address the buckle I'm gonna actually leave that in place now I know when the dentist preps this if you were to do a full restoration on it then the dentist may have to come back do an, and do a new class five before he preps it. And that's something that's going to be in my notes. You can see where this alloy already kind of popped out just by barely touching where it was fractured. And we got that kind of distal box decay going on. So for me, I'm just going to quickly uh, kind of remove the alloy. Um, at this point, I could put the rubber dam on, but out of efficiency sake, I'm just going with it. My patient's complying with me with the water, so that's nice. And I'm going to prep this little box, mesial box out as well. I'm not going to trust that, but I am making the decision to trust the buckle wall. I find if, you know, any type of restoration that's using mechanical principles to stay in place, you know, think of GV Black when you're removing this stuff. Um, I'm not going to necessarily trust that with the gentle wave as opposed to like a bonded technique, a bonded composite. I feel a little bit different about um, they tend to do a little bit better. So I don't like leaks. I hate them. Leaks being where you start a minute into the gentle wave and then patient starts tasting bleach. Don't want that ever to happen. So um, that's going to be my pre rubber dam prep work. Now that I've got those rubber dams seated underneath the contacts, 
I am going to remove the decay that's in that distal box. I get asked this all the time, like, why the heck do you always use the putty when you only got to clean it up and it just seems extra work? And that's right, it is extra work. But when you in inject the putty into those rubber dam holes, the forcep holes, it actually pushes the a little bit of a positive pressure on the rubber dam and it just creates a little bit of a seal underneath the, the or just, you know, a space filler underneath the clamp. And I like that because it just, to me, settles down, just ever so slightly settles down the rubber dam. And then when I'm removing decay, I don't catch it with my burr as easily. It still can catch because you can move it, but not as easy. Um, you can see that I've already, just by in that removing, you see a little bit of a twinge of red right here. I've already kind of entered into that pulpal anatomy space. On another video, I showed you how to address a pulp exposure uh, with your sound seal. But when it's like this and you're really into some sort of stone and not a, you know, where that pulp is atrophied to the point that it's, or not that hyperemic, a lot of times I'll just leave it and um, go right over the top of it. But right now I'm not really too worried about that. I'm just gonna just get the decay out. And the reason why, if I'm going to try to use sound seal on affected dentin or infected dentin, then it doesn't, it doesn't stick as well. When you get down to more healthy dentin, it sticks a little bit better. So I'm just doing a little bit of prep work. And right here, you, you've seen this trick. I'm just going to, it's got a little hyperemic, so obviously I'm going to address that. And guess what, guys? I'm just filling the chamber up with more of that caulking. Love that stuff, here's why. Because it's that simple and it's very easy to remove. It washes out with the gentle wave. It's just really a mute point. I like it also because it's a breadcrumb. Breadcrumb meaning it's something that I can uh, rediscover really easily. Now I'm just gonna kinda tighten up that uh, rubber dam clamp under that bow, get a nice seal. I like that rubber dam to sit below the margin the box form margin and that's kind of what I'm doing here and I and sometimes you can run a, like a perf paddle or an explorer and just kind of finesse it in the sulcus there if we got a little excessive gum tissue rolling that thing up but you can see I've got a nice seal there and I'm just drying that up so you know I, I, I like this technique a lot um, it's in real time so you know we're nine minutes and 40 seconds into this um, from the video so it's pretty quick and I'm actually ready to make a decision. Do I then access the tooth and deal with all that hyperemic tissue or do I just clean the tooth up and build my platform up? And I've done this on another case and I, I like this because it just is, it makes sense, right? You're never going backwards and you're only going forwards. For me, it doesn't feel like extra steps or work at this point in the game. If I had to do something like this after access and I'm, just a natural like regression I, I just don't like that so I leave things alone and what I'm doing right now I'm conditioning around the whole tooth it's a conditioner um, you could probably get away with just alcohol but I'm kind of just a fanatic now I just want my sound seal to stick so I don't have to go into a bond although I could um, or I just go in and just condition in place now since I'm kind of gambling a bit because I don't really want to I don't really want to remove that buckle alloy. I'm actually choosing just to put a bond layer over the top of it, just so that I have a really adapted seal in case there's any leaks around that facial um, wall of that alloy. And I've done this in the past when it's not pr the primary surface we're working on. And it tends to be uh, really nice. Primary meaning I don't trust it when it's a, like a vertical wall of like a mesial box or a distal box. But facial lingual boxes, I'll tend to just to do it because it makes me feel good and it doesn't, I've never had one sort of be affected by the gentle wave during the procedure. The other point is, I don't know if I'm going to access into that or not. I may change my mind if I drop into my access and I'm looking at an alloy wall. Um, that would be a different game. So that's something you can investigate on a comb beam if you're really worried about it. But for me, it seemed free and clear on the comb beam. And so now that I'm, now I'm just going to fill it up and I just get ready to make my mud pie. It's like, I'm in the ocean making a sandcastle now. I'm just doing it with sound seal. And that's all I'm doing is getting, you know, basic retention box, box form. What's nice about that is it's just easy to kind of connect everything together. If you're worried about the depth, you could do a pre-cure there 
and I've done that and it works great, especially if I'm in a box form that I think I'm going to tip the platform matrix into, maybe change the angle of the platform. If you pre-cure, it gives a little bit of resistance, so when you set that platform on, it, it, it just sort of is more natural and it stays flush. But in this case, um, it wasn't really something intrusive to me, and so I'm going to cure everything all at the same time, and that's why I preloaded and then connected the dots, connected the sound seal dots together, and made my mud pie right here. Now, I'll always wiggle that uh, forcep just a little bit to make sure that, that the initial set is good. And if it is, I'll take this logit of the matrix, take it off, and then just really cure this sucker and make it really tight. Um, and then there's no breadcrumb in this. I mean, there was pulp, but I did this over the pulpal floor. So that's where this is a little bit different. Instead of trying to spin out a sponge or a cotton, I'm actually doing my access now. Um, I'm using the dimple of the impression matrix to be on the pulpal floor. And then now I'm just going to access. And it's like easier when you actually have done that little trick with the caulking because you can actually see it when you get in there. And I'm just actually taking a round burr um, to get the kind of fill where it drops in. And then that way I don't get a little uh, crazy with my high speed. So I just dimpled it, found the chamber, felt that little relief zone, it dropped in. And then from there, I actually just finesse out um, with kind of a traditional diamond axis burr, which I, I prefer. So now it's just very familiar territory. And it only takes a couple of minutes. It doesn't really add more time to my access. It, it just is sort of very linear. And it's just another dental hack, a dental endo hack with this gentle wave on how to kind of just keep things flowing and, and really never feel like you have to do things twice. Once I get that in with that diamond access, then I'm going to go after these pulp stones with a round burr again. It's just, it's, it's the instrument of choice for me. You know what? I, I've kind of pendulum swung. I, I did round burrs. They were traditional surgical length round burrs, went to ultrasonics, and now I'm back to Munts burrs, actually. I really like those. Um, and I just, and, and finessing these things up and just trying to find my anatomy. Now, I remember from doing my CBCT that I had connections between my orifices. And so I'm going to actually try to look for those, at least to expose them so I feel like they're exposed to the fluid dynamics of the Geno wave. I mean, after all, if I'm going to trust the Geno wave, to, to create that, treat that isthmus, I know when I do vertical tunnels, I'm creating the fluid dynamics down the, the vertical tunnels. But if I can expose it, you know, laterally and, and cervically or, or coronally from the mechanism of the fluid dynamics, I feel like it cleans better. And so I'm not necessarily troughing out the isthmus, although you could, I would have no problem, but in conservative mindset of dentistry, conserving the dental, the dentin junction right there, maybe you, you don't want to do that or feel uncomfortable doing that, but at least expose it. I mean, you can take that purple, it's so tiny, and just kind of trace the line a little bit and just, just try to expose that. By the way, when you do that, I do find more anatomy, and that's kind of my goal. I know I've got to fill up an isthmus, and I want to know if I'm going to see it on, a, on an x-ray. Um, sometimes I feel a little selfish that I want to take a post-op comb beam, which is always appropriate if you feel necessary, but if you can get it to see that anatomy on a 2D or an angled 2D, that's nice too. Um, less steps for the patient. So um, now that I've done that, I'm just going to get my bearings. I'm taking hand hypo as if I would if it was a normal access. Um, mind you, you don't really get bubbles or voids in this type of technique. I like showing bubbles and voids in the sound seal only to show you how to patch them, but I don't really want them. And when I do it this way, they're just never there. So that's always nice. I never am going back and patching work. I'm not doing patchwork. So now that I'm there, there's a debate on do you really know your length? And so this is something that you're going to lean not only on the comb beam, but really on an apex locator in this technique because you've just changed your occlusal height per se. Maybe not, but maybe so. You don't necessarily know. So I'm passing just a 1504 into those. Sometimes it's an 06. I usually prefer an 06, but these are fairly open, so it was an 04. Just, just to get, to make in length termination a little bit easier. But now I'm really just using an apex locator here. I'm not really thinking so much about my CBCT length. 
And I'm using my calibrated marks. If you can see, I'm not actually sliding that rubber stopper down. It moves around. I just feel like I like looking at the marker. This is a 31 millimeter 10 file. It's just so it's easy to bend away and, and lay the calibrated mark up against your cable surface margin for length determination. That way everything's done under a microscope. I'm not holding a finger ruler. I'm not trying to measure. I mean, you can do that for show, um, but it's not, it's not in my muscle memory anymore. I just, my muscle memory is all under the microscope. And now I'm just going to try to expose and, and, and kind of show those isthmuses in the mesial and the distal. That's kind of the uh, positive affirmation when you're doing the gentle wave, seeing those puppies open up, um, knowing that it, the technology is actually being employed as you're hoping to employ it, meaning the fluid dynamics is doing the job as stated. Um, without clinical trials and you know some of the debates that are going on there, all we have is our feedback. Um, but it's very important that we still use what's best in class for us and we still have a job to do. And right now with the FDA approving it, I'm going to run it. And I'm going to let it be the best that I can be in, in cleaning up anatomy that I'm worried about. Because if I try to go at this with ultrasonics, if I try to go at this with um, a rotary file, I'm at risk for strip perfing. Certainly in that mesial, we saw it on the anatomy. You can't argue against if fluid does its job that that's the best way to proceed. And, and that's the best service I can give my patients, and my patients deserve that. That's what I feel. So um, now that I'm going down, I'm taking, um, this one is uh, a scout file from Brassler, a really handy file. It gives you that in-between size between like a 10 and a 15, and a 15 and a 20, I should say. It's um, misspoke there, it's 15 and a 20, so it's a size 17 tip and then I'm going to the yellow band to a 20. So these files that I'm using are actually Brassler Edge files. Excuse me, <laughs> they would hate me. Don't say that again. It's on video though, I said it. They're Brassler Scout files. Scout, not Edge. But I like Edge and I like Scout. I like them both. You can like more than one. All right, because see what I did there? After using those um, Scouts, I actually went to a 1506. The reason for that is I've learned that when you get into these more flimsy obturation sizes or um, instrumentation sizes, you got to still do convenience form for obturation. It's still a pain to take little tiny files with isthmuses with fluid dynamics where the walls aren't glassy clean, that smooth feeling, they're not planed out, they're clean, but they don't have that glassy clean feel because the natural morphology is still there. We didn't take a file to plane them out. And, and so the undulations internally can be felt with gutta percha, whereas, and it kind of snags it and can crinkle your tone cones and you don't get to length. And that is frustrating. And you kind of figure out your tricks on how to obturate the gentle waves type case. But until we have a better solution for that and we're using a master cone of sorts, I find that if I take a 1506, I get enough planing of the walls <clears throat> to set my gutta percha in the sealer stew. So that's what I like. So I'm doing that as well. Um, now that I've done that, I didn't take that to length, by the way. I just did that in the coronal two thirds. And then I'm just going back in with a 15 and a 20 into the kind of the terminus zone, the apical one third. And I'm just cleaning that out. And this is traditional instrumentation. Now, can you create flashing with the sound seal? Of course you can. Just like you can create dentinal mud and debris with dentin in your access or um, creating amalgam chips if you left an amalgam wall exposed. So those are some of the things that are normal to us and so I'm not worried about sound seal in that. And it flushes out quite, and in fact it floats, so it's easy to remove. The other thing is I paid attention as I'm looking around the floor to make sure that buckle wall, that alloy, isn't seen in my access. Because if it was, then I got a debate. Is that external bond and sound seal sufficient to maintain that vertical buckle wall? But I didn't have to run into that, so that's good. Now I'm just going really fast with those jigs. I'm trying to scratch the floor. And um, I'm at a blue, and I felt it scratch on the red. And I can't, I don't think it's scratching on the blue, but maybe on a certain spot. 
but the decision was I always known the goal is to get the sound uh, bar like hovering as close without touching the pulpal floor. And so um, that's what I did. I measured that and I know I'm like right there with the blue. So I'm going to put a blue on and I'm going to just kind of show you the access here. Um, looking through that cap just to show you that I got plenty of exhaust. Um, Ninja accesses don't allow necessarily enough exhaust pathway and I'm just looking at that that I can see you know not blue in the hole of that cap. Put it on the procedural instrument and then I'm ready to go. Now when I'm looking at it I got a pinhole right here and if I were to have if Lindsay was doing her notes or not suctioning, this little pinhole right here might leak a little, just like leftover bleach or irrigant. So for me, I'm gonna address that with some more caulking. Or you can fill the whole thing up with um, sound seal. You could use either material. And candidly, I use whatever my assistant hands me at this point, but the caulking is sufficient. Just fill that puppy up. And uh, now, I'm gonna, now I'm gonna run. And if you see me, I'm actually, as it runs, there's a little bit of vibration. There's the energy of the flow going through that procedural instrument. And I'm almost like, God, I'm not really getting that tight seal. I feel like I'm having to push down on it. And I think I was bumping up on some undulations in the pulpal floor. So maybe I didn't scratch well enough. I was going too fast. And so I'm making my mind up, man, is that, is that a bad seal? Am I touching the floor? It's kind of hard to tell floor of the pulpal floor, it's kind of hard to tell, but I know I'm getting air leaks and I know that it's just sort of bumping something. Patient's not reporting any pain. So I'm looking again, I'm liking the seal, so what do I do? Do I abort or did I maybe make a measurement error? So for me, I'm telling Lindsay, change the cap. A lot of guys, when you do minimal instrumentation, you're not worried about air embolism if you blow air directly into the chamber as maybe you would otherwise be. And then you um, can look for any air coming out. I don't really subscribe to that. What I was doing is trying to rule out possibilities. And I felt like I had an undercut way down deep in there. And so um, I'm actually going to patch it right here. And I'm doing that and then I'm gonna have Lindsay also changed the cap. And the idea is, is I, I don't know why I'm getting that little air leak. So for me, if I can identify more than one thing, I'm just going to do them all. So a quick, quick little cure. It's not hard to problem solve, but it's really important skill set. It's just, it's something I think we all need to be more cognizant of. And it's okay to keep working. Our job is to protect our patients. Our job is to employ the GenoWave to the best of our ability. And now you can see that I put a green cap on right here. And now let's see what happens. Modify the, the internal anatomy. Don't know if it made a difference. And then I changed the cap to give me a little more space because I think the angle of that um, was touching a pulp stone or some undulations underneath the pulpal floor. And now I'm feeling like this is exactly what I want. So lesson learned. It's a great lesson to show you guys in case it happens to you. By the way, comment on any things that you've learned along these little tips and tricks and, and share on the feed and let's get a discussion going on so we can see, learn from each other. Um, I'm just kind of showing you what I'm learning, how I'm learning in real time. And now it's just going through the degassing phase and I keep throwing this video up because I can and people tend to like watching it. So it's just a reminder of what's going on. It's not made by me, but it's just something to pay attention to and think about while you're working and that's setting in. I also find on the lower jaw, if you feel like you're putting apical pressure on, people's chins start tucking down and that's not something they really enjoy. It kind of can trigger, they feel like they can't swallow or they feel like their airway gets constricted like that. So you can support underneath with your hand um, or bite block because then they can bite against the bite block and kind of that helps them feel like they're resisting any downward pressure. Um, I'm actually resting my thumb on it here, frankly, because what the patient's doing is resting on my thumb. 
and it gives gives a little bit more support and less feeling like I'm pushing down. And actually, I feel like I'm using less pressure that way um, in that scenario. And so what that's doing then is giving me an ideal environment for this mechanism and that sound bar hovering over the pulpal floor and allowing that energy, that fluid dynamics to go down into those spaces. And this is where we're trusting advanced chemistry. So we have a catalyst with agitation from the sound wave and um, the cavitation cloud and that vortex flow acts like an agitation catalyst to the chemistry. So that's the chemistry found in the bleach. So dissolving organic matter. We have the collapsing of the bubbles creating the sound, the white noise, the broad spectrum acoustics going through fluid. Um, and that's going down the canal and sort of lapping up against the internal anatomy inside that. And so that's what that business is about. And then it's because it's all in of this fluid dynamic environment where it's creating negative pressure, there's sort of an exhausting going on as fluid comes in, fluid is coming out. And that fluid is what lifts up content as well. So those are kind of the three basic principles in layman's terms of what's going on. And it's quite nice when I want to employ that in that space. We talked about the risk in that isthmus, mesial, distal isthmuses, and I want something to go in between. And you kind of start creating a racetrack in that environment. As it starts working down one canal, the fluid comes down the other. They may connect through at different levels. And as you get a racetrack going on there, it really starts cleaning. And what you find is that there's this period of a breaking point inside, like it works, 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 and then it just goes. Um, and you've seen that in a lot of like Eric Cabranson's videos and some of the other explainer videos and kind of benchtop modeling that's gone on. If you, if you search the internet, you'll see that. I, I like what Eric Cabranson has done. I feel like he's done a great job capturing the essence and the timing of it. Um, there are other videos you can go on it and kind of get a visual of what's happening internally and stay tuned because I'm going to take my own attempt at demonstrating that video on one of these um, feeds as well to kind of just sort, sort of watch what happens. But as you kind of watch what's going on internally, it's kind of funny where it just goes, 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 and then it breaks through, breaks through in, in how it dissolves the tissue and, and lifts and eradicates the contents. And so. Um, kind of interesting and it's also kind of interesting why you want to hum through the whole cycle and not have a lot of stopping times. Um, sometimes patients got to pee and that's fine. You got to pee, you got to pee. Maybe you have to go next door and you're letting that environment just sit and the, the machine will allow that and will allow degassing to occur before the time clock starts counting. But I really like a consistent cycle. Um, I feel like it does a better job in um, the protocols that we're, we're looking because when they when they study the protocols they're studying the full the full time and bench top and so I want to re reproduce that as much as I can for my patient's benefit. They do give us the option by the way to advance and people ask me all the time well why would we want that if you just after saying what you said and the reality is is what if where well, there's other circumstances what if there's a, a resorption defect that was undiagnosed you know, what if there was an instrumentation error? What if there was, it was just too efficient? And, and you start noticing um, contents or separations coming through the end. You might want to advance if, if I start seeing things. And, um, and that's a clinical judgment. And the timing of that comes by experience, and that's why you're a doctor. That's why I'm a doctor, and we, we have to learn when to advance. And there are times that I do advance, um, namely, when I start seeing pink clouds come through here because I know I'm patent at that point. And I always can go back, especially in vital cases, go back and recheck my work with a file and see if there's any tissue tags in there. I mean, we still have the way we've been doing it to always trust, but always verify our findings. And that way I think, you know, that's why we got a job. It's why a monkey's not proverbially doing this or why maybe our assistants shouldn't just hold this. Although they could, and some do. Mine don't, by my request. They would if I, if I let them, probably. I let them do other things. They can build platforms like a champ, by the way. That's, some, that's a skill set you can teach them. Some of the building of that, and they get really good at it. And then you can go do a, a consult next door, keep your busy schedule going to work multiple rooms. It's important. All right, so we're 32 minutes into this. And we're coming near the end. 
I know that because look at my assistant. She's ready for the next game. So you see her, she's, she's grabbing the hemostats. She's preparing what I'm going to want next. She's paying attention to the console and kind of what's happening there and just the countdown. You can count down or count up on it if you haven't learned that, whatever your preferences are. I like counting down more than counting up. So I've got my, I've got my console, you know, going backwards. Now that I'm done, let's get this in focus. Take a look at these isthmuses. It's always fun to look at. And that's all work, the handiwork of fluid. And the front one, you can see a lot of, you know, um, dentin. And even from that troughing it, it's really natural. But that doesn't mean it doesn't connect below that point. And that's the point. This one's nice to see because it's open. But the mesial could be connected mid root, apical third, wherever it is, it is. And not only that, we could have lateral anatomy extending to the ligament. And so that's why we're in this mindset of the game of fluids. Now you're watching me kind of peel now the sound seal off the tooth because I bonded everything. I'm not seeing any communication along that buccal wall or bleeding. So I know that maintained its integrity during the procedure, the procedure. And I'm taking it off. Now in the box form, there's a lot of retention. So it's a little harder to pick those things out. It's easy to tear. You can drill it out too if, if you want. I'm just kind of picking it out with my cotton pliers. You know, and it kind of speaks to how nice would it be if you could leave it in. Because it could be a great temporary. It's got to be opaque though. All right, so I'm just flushing now with, with saline. And then we'll kind of go to our paper points and then working length here. Enjoying the, the clean view of that pulpal floor. These are 20 cones. They're both kind of dropping in at the same length on those calibrated marks. We always get a tendency, but I tend to always put the lingual in before the buckle. I don't know why. I just always have. And then I will obturate in the same way I place. So that's why I always am consistent in how I place. And then there's my working lathe. So um, now if we can use this master cone to kind of express the sealer. I know a lot of doctors will actually pre-dry and put sealer in and then place the cones in. Uh, Jimbo Smith is one of the just super, super talented, and that's the way that he chooses to obturate, and he taught me that, and, and that is something that is really clever and really nice, because then you know exactly where those lateral anatomies are, and if you want to pump more sealer in, you can, so kudos to you, Jimbo, for teaching me that trick. I didn't show it in this part, but I should. You should take credit for it and show it, because that's a great trick. I really appreciated learning that from you. So give Jimbo uh, Smith a shout out and uh, let's get him making a video for us. Be good. So you have to look at my ugly mug all the time. And my so just drying at this point, um, wicking out what I can. I really don't want fluid in there. Um, if I have a lot of fluid or I do a lot of drying, I'm going to go to a BC, a bioceramic sealer. If it's dry, I like the opacity and, and they've just got a ton of experience using ribbon and a ton of success using that. So I will still use a, a combo of sealers. Um, but that's a lot of preferences, I guess. Tomato, tomato for some. No, there's not so much. Bent my cone, so Lindsay was so kind to have another one handy for me. Now, I could have removed all the sound seal if I wanted, but I didn't. 
like I said, that sound soul could be left in and radio opaque on my x-ray. For all those people listening, I'd really appreciate that. So remake that product. That way, temporization and platform build can be one and the same. Just saying. So you've seen obturations before, nothing dramatic going on here. Kind of continuous wave. We all probably have a version of this technique. Um, nothing much there. A little bit of positive down pack. You know, Ajimbo with his technique and the way he does his cone fit with sealer and then re-verification and an application a second time if necessary, he finds that he just sears it off at the orifice and then just down packs that. And he, he in his protocol, will, will use all bioceramics. He doesn't use um, ribbon. So if you watch that, you could see that kind of clean up that isthmus since it was painting all the way up in that distal, which is really kind of fun eye candy to watch. Mesials, we don't know much until, until you know, obturation, and we hope to see fireworks or rockets. Now, on this one, because if you look, go back and watch, it didn't speak of this, but sometimes I'll see little, like, seepage of fluid coming through that isthmus as sealer kind of pushes through. And because of that, I, it just gets me thinking, I, I want to wick it out. So what you saw me do is place a paper point right there just to dry that um, distal buckle one. And then I'm just going to um, down pack it, just reapply sealer and down pack it. And I'm only paying more attention in these videos to the products I'm using because I'm getting phone calls. Um, I'm not really promoting anything. I'm just showing my technique and would and hope that you guys can show your technique in return and we could all share this on this dental learning live format so we can learn together I've gotten a lot of comments um, on another video of just different isolation techniques and I really would love to see other people's techniques on these and again I'm happy to go side by side videos if you want to just reach out to me and send the video if you don't want to put it on the channel um, we'll put it on the channel and we could even crop two things together, different isolation techniques or different techniques. So the more the merrier, this is definitely an open source game here. So um, anybody that wants to uh, contribute anything, just send it, to, send it my way. So please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. Um, we will be putting uh, post-op x-rays out and restorations out, um, post-treatments. Um, so, you know, you'll want to subscribe so you can get notified, you know, and you can go back and see what's new to the video that perhaps you may have watched before. The one that's coming up was this big retreatment one that I did. It's, I think it's got the most views. Anyways, that one's coming in next week and then we'll get that one up for their recall. So, you know, what, what I'm doing now is I'm done with obturation. I'm cleaning the floor. I like using a bird to clean the floor. So at this point, I'm just removing the... Um, sound seal. And it's interesting, I got to remove it, right? Which is why I keep saying it's a good seal and should definitely meet the, the requirements of a temporary. And the question is, could we leave that as a temporary? You answer that. Let me know what you think. I'm cleaning that up now. And then uh, at this point, uh, if you, your dentist wants you to restore, you restore. If they want you to temporize, you temporize. Mm -hmm. And by the way, when you do a little removal at this point, anything the, 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 the gentle wave may have dissolved out gets to be cleaned up a second round with a burr. So that's quite nice. You know you're leaving clean dentin at this point in that chamber, which theoretically should be a great um, bond. And so for any residents watching, that's a good residency project somebody should be doing is run the gentle wave and then check bond strengths with composites afterwards or sound seal afterwards. Make an argument for temporization. Some resident be popular. So, you know, I'm gonna pack a sponge in there 
and then just use a traditional uh, cabot type material. 45 mi minutes into this case. I'm just packing the temp in. You know, sometimes I, I, I really don't mind leaving contacts open in this, especially when you set it with a rubber dam in place. And you can really push it in and then the rubber dam can dislodge it, but it can also help remove it so it's easier to clean up afterwards if you've got a really good technique. And so I like that perf paddle, that east-west perf paddle. And I'll, I'll just um, actually kind of try to burnish back those margins so the rubber dam can come through without dislodging the box form. So it's, sometimes it's not an exact science, sometimes it doesn't work, but when it works it's fantastic. And you know what I mean, when that comes through, you don't want to dislodge that. So looks like I just tore it, which also works. And then just clean up the mess. Wonderful uh, patient. But really non-eventful. I mean, that's what we like. Very consistent, and no surprises, very comfortable. Patients love us, great outcomes, no post-operative pain. And then boom, we get some kind of love and rockets shooting out the end. So let's take a closer look. So let's turn my ugly mug off here and take a look at this. So um, temporary, buckle filling, temporary, and man, you can just see, so let's go over that again, I think my arrow was on. So temporary, amalgam, temporary, and then you can see the little rocket ships shooting out all over through here. Um, internal anatomy is fantastic in a case like this, and that's that. So that's what I'm calling love and rockets. So please subscribe. Please uh, address some of the questions I'm calling out to you guys, and uh, let's keep this thing going. So thanks for, thanks for watching.